So a couple months ago, there were a series of questions that were asked within the NSAB uh, about uh, what, how much tritium is in water. And uh, there were other questions like, um, what if the UE arbitrarily decided to lower the, the uh, reference dose limit or the regulatory threshold for tritium in order to make uh, our studies out there even more protective of human health. And so uh, DOE and I consulted on a presentation that we'd like to give to you to hopefully answer some of those questions and to, uh, to uh, make you more informed on the topic. All right, so with that, we're going to start on, uh, there's going to be four elements to this talk. First of all, we're going to talk about uh, the fundamentals of tritium, um, what it is, how much there is on Earth. We're going to talk about the, uh, the amount of tritium that you would have to ingest in order to hit the regulatory standard uh, and the reference dose limit associated with that. Uh, we're going to talk about the dose that one would receive if you drank the regulatory standard for you know, for an entire year, all the water that you consumed and how much dose you would get from that and how that compares to other doses that are, are present in your life. And then finally, we were going to look at what's called the reference dose limit and the regulatory standard for the U.S. And, and look at how that compares to those items in other countries. And of course, if you have a question, just turn your name tag up and I'll try to answer it at that time. So starting off with the basics of tritium, what, what is tritium? Tritium is, is the radioactive form of hydrogen. All right, there are three isotopes of hydrogen, and I think I've got this right. Yeah, so the most common form is, uh, it's actually called, got a name, it's called protium, and there's one proton, no neutrons, all right? And that comprises the majority of hydrogen on, on Earth, 99.985% percent of all hydrogen is protium and it's, it's non-radioactive. The second co most common isotope of hydrogen on Earth is deuterium and that's comprised of one proton and one neutron and it, again it's called deuterium, that's its name, and it comprises about 0.015 percent of all hydrogen on Earth. These two combined create the vast majority of hydrogen on Earth. The third form of hydrogen is tritium, and it's comprised of one proton, two neutrons, which makes the nucleus unstable. It has a half-life of 12.3 years, and it decays through the emission of a beta particle. And when it does that, it turns into an isotope of helium called helium-3. All right? And because it is radioactive um, and it has a relatively short half-life, there's not much of it about. So if you, here's the decimal point, and here are 15 zeros, and then a one, and that's a percentage, all right? So it's really, 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 really rare, okay? All right, so what are the sources of tritium on Earth? Uh, well, there's, there's a natural source, there are natural sources, and then there are also man-made sources. And, the primary natural source for tritium is the interaction of cosmic rays with the atmosphere. A cosmic ray uh, will strike an uh, atom of nitrogen and it will break it apart into carbon-12 and a, a tritium atom. And that's the primary source for tritium in our atmosphere. This occurs naturally and normally when we talk about the amount of tritium, we usually talk about it in terms of mass but we've converted it in terms of weight, pounds, something that you're very familiar with so that when we tell you how much tritium there is, think of it as in pounds, okay? So on an annual basis, the natural production rate of tritium on Earth is about 0.3 to 0.4 pounds per year. Now every year, a little bit of that decays away and every year, a little more is, is generated and if you average that out over a long term, there's between six and eight pounds of tritium on Earth due to this natural process. So it's not very much. You think about all the water on Earth, and, or I'm sorry, all the hydrogen on Earth, most of it's in the form of water, and only six to eight pounds of that hydrogen is actually tritium, and the rest is either protium or deuterium. Mankind is another source of tritium. 
all right? And this uh, occurs primarily through nuclear testing or uh, uh, nuclear reactors, all right? Uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s, there was thermonuclear testing out in the Pacific, and this injected a tremendous amount of tritium into the atmosphere. During that period of time, about 1,000 to 1,500 pounds of tritium were injected into the atmosphere and became water molecules and were distributed to, you know, throughout the hydrosphere, all the water on Earth. Of course, that's radioactive. And that's been multiple decades, so it's been decaying away. As of 2019, there's about 40 pounds of that left, all right? Most of it's converted over to helium-3, but there's about 40 pounds of that left, and it's distributed throughout the hydrosphere of Earth. Now, of course, we also had uh, testing on the Nevada test site, right? So uh, that created tritium underground as well. So as of 2019, there's about 4.9 pounds of tritium in the subsurface on the Nevada National Security Site, all right? And so to compare that amount with the amount that's created by a nuclear reactor, so for a 900 megawatt pressurized reactor, there is about 0 .000066 pounds of tritium per year for every reactor out there. So it's not very much. It's a very small source, and that's the second largest man-made source there is. The rest of them are fairly inconsequential. <clears throat> now, one thing about tritium is that we can detect it in amazingly small amounts. Uh, the are low limit detections for specialized analysis, the types of analysis that you can do at these highly specialized laboratories like University of Miami and, and at Lawrence Livermore and other areas, they can detect at one picocurie per liter, all right? And that's three tritium atoms in a one followed by 19 zero protium atoms, hydro, regular hydrogen atoms, all right? The term for that is 0.3 parts per quintillion, all right? So we know parts per thousand, all right? Well, this is way, way smaller than that. We know parts per million. It's way smaller than that. We know parts per billion. We know parts per trillion. This is a million, oops, this is a million times smaller than a parts per trillion. So we can detect just amazingly small amounts of tritium in a water sample. So even with regular analysis, the, which is associated with 1,000 picocuries per liter, um, there are 310 tritium atoms in a one followed by 18 zero protium atoms or normal hydrogen atoms, all right? And that's, so that's 310 parts per qu quintillion, not parts per thousand, smaller than that, not parts per million, smaller than that, not parts per billion, smaller than that, not parts per trillion, a million times smaller than that. That's what we can detect, all right? So, so we, we can detect amazingly small amounts of tritium in a water sample. So the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has established a dose-based drinking water, drinking water standard for a beta emitters of four millirems per year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, all right? And we assume, or the EPA has told us, that if I have a bottle of water, and this is one liter, by the way, and it has 20,000 picocuries of tritium in it, so 20,000 picocuries per liter, that constitutes the regulatory standard for tritium. So 20,000 picocuries per liter in one liter of water, all right? If I drink that every day, two of these bottles every day, for an entire year, I will, EPA tells me that I will achieve four millirems per year, all right? So that's what I have to drink in order to achieve the regulatory standard. So let's break that down a little bit. So the term, the term picocurie, oops, this little term right here stands for picocuries per, lotter, per, per liter. A liter is one liter of water, all right? A curie, a curie is the amount of any radioactive substance that produces 37 billion, so it's not very consistent, 37 billion radioactive disintegrations every second. 
And a disintegration is a process by which an unstable atomic nucleus loses energy by emitting radiation such as an alpha particle or for tritium, a beta particle. All right? And then a pico is a very, very, very small portion of anything. So a pico curie is a very small portion of a, chur of a curie. It's one trillionth of a curie. So it's a curie divided by a one followed by 12 zeros. It's a very, very small amount. So how much activity is in a, a bottle of water, one liter of water, that has 20,000 picocuries of tritium in it. There are, based on the definition of what a curie is, all right, that's 740 disintegrations per second. All right, so there's still a fair amount of activity in this water if it's 20,000 picocuries per liter. How much tritium, now we're talking about mass, how much tritium do I need in order to achieve 20,000 picocuries per liter in one liter of water? That's two trillionths of a gram. So it's a two with, I don't know how many zeros in front of it, how many is a 10 or 11 zeros in front of it, okay? It's a very, very, very small amount of tritium is required to achieve 20,000 picocuries in a liter of water. So how do I, how do I relate to that number, all right? So we're gonna do a little mind experiment here and hopefully this makes it clear and doesn't muddle anything up. So let's pretend that instead of 20,000 picocuries, I actually have one curie of tritium in a liter of water, all right? And I want to, to be able to uh, use this water to kind of show you how much or how far this curie will go in getting uh, a standard of 20,000 picocuries per liter. So what I've decided to do is I've decided to take this bottle and divide it into very, 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 very small amounts. I'm gonna take 50 million little subsamples of this bottle of water, all right? And I'm gonna put it in tiny little cups. And I'm gonna give it to everybody who lives in Texas and Florida, and that's about 50 million people, all right? And then I'm going to, so they all have a tiny amount of tritium in that little cup of water that they each have. And then I'm gonna walk up to one of them, just one, and I'm gonna give them, I'm gonna have a bottle of water with me that has no tritium in it, all right? And I'm gonna say, can I have your cup? All right, and I'm gonna add it to this water, and that's gonna give me 20,000 picocuries per liter, all right? It's a very small amount of tritium will achieve the regulatory standard. And hopefully that kind of helps you conceive of, of how little tritium is in 20,000 picocuries per liter and how little tritium there actually is on Earth. Okay, so let's start talking about dose. A REM is a unit of effective absorbed dose of ionizing radiation in human tissue, okay? And then one one thousandth of a REM is called a millirem, right? The US, it, on, in general, the, the EPA tells us that an average member of the U.S. public receives about 620 millirem of dose from all sources. This is an average. Some people get a lot more, some people get a lot less, but on average, we all receive about 620 millirems per year, okay? According to the EPA, remember what I told you, if I have a bottle of water with 20,000 picocuries per liter in it, and I drink two of these bottles per day, every day for a year, I'm gonna get four millirems, all right? So that would add to this 620 millirems per year dose, all right? So I, if I did that, I would be getting 624. So let's compare the various sources of that dose um, that I receive as an average person in the United States and compare it to the amount that I would get if I decided to drink water at 20,000 picocuries per liter. Uh, this is a bar chart here and this is millirems per year. It's a cumulative amount and each one of these little guys is a contributing source to the 620 millirems per year. Uh, most of it on average is from medical procedures. There's uh, some people in the United States who are getting radiation therapy for different things and they get a very high dose, all right? And if you average that over the entire U.S. population, it averages out 
to 298 millirems per year for each of us. Now obviously, you know, some of us are not getting it, some of us are getting a lot of it, but on average it's 298 millirems per year. So that's a major contribution to the average dose that the U.S. population is receiving. Another major player is radon. Radon is an odorless, colorless gas. It's produced naturally as part of the uranium-thorium decay chain. There's uranium and thorium in rocks all over the United States. And as they decay naturally, as part of that decay chain, they produce radon gas. And radon gas will seep out of the ground, it'll seep into groundwater, people will pump that groundwater out, and if they drink it untreated, they will get a dose from that. Or if their basement is built into the granite, radon gas will seep into granite, or into the basement. And if they spend a lot of time in the basement, they'll get a dose from that radon. Not all of us, you know, not all of us live up in the Rockies, all right? Uh, some of us do, um, but if you, on average, we get 230 millirems per year. I should have said Sierras, not Rockies. Um, 230 millirems per year, on average, is from radon. The human body itself, because we grew up on Earth, the rocks are radioactive, our bones become radioactive, so we, have a, a, we give a dose to ourselves just by living on Earth. So the human body produces, on average, about 31 millirems per year. Um, I told you how tritium was made in the upper atmosphere. It's cosmic rays that are, that are slamming down into the atmosphere and reacting with nitrogen gas. Well, some of those go all the way through the atmosphere and they hit us and they give us a dose. And on average, that dose is 30 millirems per year. The rocks, I remember I told you the rocks contain uranium thorium and if I just kind of hang around the rocks and, and uh, work in them or you know, carry the dust inside my house, the uranium and thorium in that rock decay and they will give a dose, all right? 19 milliramps per year. Consumer products within our house, um, ionizing smoke detectors in your house, they have a small amount of americium-241 in them. They will produce a dose. You're exposed to that. There are other products that will also give you a dose. That averages about tw oops, got, got it. 12 milliramps per year. So uh, with all those sources cumulatively, if I decided to drink this 20,000 pico curious per liter, two liters per day for an entire year, would add an incrementally just a four milliram dose on top of everything that I'm already getting. That four milliram dose is roughly equivalent to a decision if I decided to get into an airplane in Los Angeles and fly to New York take a cross-country flight. I'm getting above the atmosphere, a good portion of it, which shields us from cosmic rays. I'm getting an enhanced dose from cosmic rays during that flight. And that amount of dose is about three and a half millirems per year. So every time you fly across the country, you're getting an, an increase in your dose of three and a half millirems per year. Okay. So what's this risk of chronic exposure? Um, chronic radiation dose is a small amount of radiation received over a long period of time. And the principal effect of chronic radiation dose is an increased risk of contracting cancer, okay? There's a term called latent cancer fatality. It's the likelihood that a dose of radiation will result in death from cancer at some future time, okay? And they, uh, health physicists have have models where they look at the dose that, uh, uh, that a person is exposed to and then they look at the amount of cancer that, that increases as a result of that dose. Unfortunately, because of the way things work, um, it takes a lot of dose, really high doses, before you ever see an incremental increase in the cancer risk, all right? And so the EPA and others have decided that, that we're going to develop a model that says even an incrementally small amount uh, increase in the dose will result in an increase in cancer. And in fact, that, that model, which is called the linear threshold model, um, has no data to support it on the lower end on these really small dose rates. It's a bit of a guess. And there's actually competing models that say, well, not really. You know, you could get a small amount of dose and see no increase in cancer. And so there's different models that these health physicists argue about. And they're, they're the basis for establishing the, the reference dose limit, the four milligrams per year that they utilize. And it can result in a fair amount of confusion. Or not confusion, but differences in how different people treat it. But in the U.S., we've decided that, that 
for the consumption of four milligram of a beta or photon emitter per year, all right, and tritium is a beta emitter, in drinking water over your lifetime will increase a, your lifetime cancer risk of 0 .000056. That's basically equal to one out of 17,857 people. All right, but in actuality, there have been no human studies that have demonstrated that a small amount of tritium causes cancer in humans, all right? Now, there have been laboratory studies where large amounts of tritium have been given to mice, and they've been able to induce increases in cancer from that. But that's at doses of 50 rem per year. That would be equivalent to, instead of 20,000 picocuries per liter, I'd be drinking water at 250 million picocuries per liter, two bottles a day, every day, for an entire year. That would give me 50 rem. It's a lot, all right? The American can for comparison, the American Cancer Society has estimated that the lifetime risk of an individual dying from cancer is one out of five, all right? And that's, those are terrible odds, right? Uh, but in relatively speaking to the odds from tritium, you're drinking a beta emitter, it's one out of 17,857. So if you decided to drink the 20,000 picocurie per liter standard, two bottles a day, every day for a year, uh, the amount, your risk of increasing cancer is very, very small. But you remember that there is no data that actually supports that. It's based on this linear threshold model that doesn't have data on the lower end. So the four milliram per year is what we call a reference dose. It's the level of radiation dose above which it is not appropriate to plan to allow exposures to occur and below which protection and safety are optimized. The World Health Organization has recommended a reference dose level of 10 milligrams per year for assessing health risks to, to an individual from prolonged exposure to radionuclides in drinking water, including tritium. The International Atomic Energy Agency has a basic safety standard of 100 milligrams per year. That's a big range, all right? And most countries have adopted something along that particular spectrum. So let's take a look at where the U.S. falls versus everybody else. Australia has established a reference dose level of 100 milligrams per year, which is equivalent to 2, 2 million picocuries per liter of water, all right? Finland has adopted a reference dose level of 50 milligrams per year, and that's equivalent to 810,000 picocuries per liter. Most other countries, Switzerland, Russia, Canada, European Union, they've adopted a 10 milligram uh, reference dose limit, which is equi roughly equivalent to 200,000 picocuries per liter. The European Union, being the groovy group that they are, all right, they have decided that, that they want to be uber protective of their population. So even though they adopted a 10 milligram per year uh, reference dose limit, they say that it only takes 2,700 picocuries per liter to achieve that. The U.S. has decided that they're going to use a 4 milligram per year reference dose limit. And originally when that dose limit was established, they thought that 20,000 picocuries per liter is what you really needed in order to achieve that reference dose limit. Well, it turns out in 2003, they did a number of studies and they decided that, well, it's not really 20,000 picocuries per liter. It's actually closer to 61,000 picocuries per liter. And there was a big discussion in the, in the early 2000s about whether or not we should change the regulatory standard for tritium. But the end of that discussion was that, well, 20,000 is protective enough, so let's just keep it. So the 20,000 actually equates to a reference dose limit of 1.3 milliram per year, which is actually below the reference dose limit that the U.S. has officially adopted. <clears throat> so, and then just as sort of anecdotally, kind of to put things further into perspective, the uh, only well that we have so far that is groundwater in it that is close to, not exceeding, but close to the regulatory standard for tritium is EREC 11. That well is 13.8 miles to the closest offsite receptor. Current models for Paiute Mesa 
do not protect contaminants to reach off-site populations that exceed the regulatory thresholds. So putting all of this down, let's, let's look our take -home, at our take-home messages from this presentation. One is that there is a surprisingly small amount of tritium on Earth, but it only takes a very, very, very small amount of that tritium to be detected. Two trillionths of a gram of tritium is all it takes to raise a liter of water to the reference dose standard, or I'm sorry, to the regulatory threshold of 20,000 picocuries per liter. The reference dose limit that the U.S. has adopted is 2.5 to 25 times less than that used by most other countries. The U.S. has purposely underestimated by a factor of three the tritium activity that will actually yield a 4 milliram dose. Right? And the U.S. regulatory standard of 20,000 picocuries per liter is approximately a factor of 10 less than that used by most other countries. The take-home message is part two. The distance to the closest off-site receptor is 13.8 miles. Current estimates of contaminant transport uh, indicate that groundwater will not exceed the regulatory thresholds off-site. Uh, there are multiple monitoring wells between the NNSS and the down gradient populations that we use to track the movement of tritium plume. And there's only one well, EREC 11, uh, that it's located off the test site but on federally restricted land, the Nevada Test and Training Rate, that contains tritium that is close to exceeding the regulatory standard. And that is my final slide. So there haven't been any questions so far, but I'm willing, happy to take them now if you have them. Anyone uh, knowingly been affected by uh, that uh, chemical or died from it or been seriously ill? Any statistics? They're, uh, not to my knowledge. Um, now, I'm, I'm a hydrogeologist. I'm not a health physicist. So, you know, you could take that question and, 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 and apply it to them, but not to my knowledge. Yes, Chuck. Uh, I guess my, my question is more uh, on the side of the half-life of tritium being 12 and a half years or whatever, and uh, the fact, or I guess the rule of thumb is more that like, what is it, 10 half-lives pretty much, or is it 100 half-lives pretty much? goes down to zero? It's below the regulatory standard. So pretty much everything we've ever measured on the test site, if you give it 10 half-lives, it'll all be below the regulatory threshold, even the water inside the cavity. Okay. That being said, I mean, we don't have much more time until it's all gone. Yeah, yeah, we've already been doing this for, well, 1990. 93 was the last test? 92, yeah, 92 was the last test. So that's 17 years, that's more than one half-life there, but the average age of the tests are actually much older. They're, you know, they're 30, 40, 50 years old. And so we've had multiple half-lives for those. Okay. And so it's sort of a moving target. You know, the tritium is constantly moving in one direction, and you've got all of it in the beginning, but as radioactive decay occurs, it begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller concentrations. And eventually, even the most concentrated portion at time zero, at the time of the detonation, that will actually decay away to, to below the Safe Drinking Water Act standard. Well, I guess it's my point, too, that that perhaps might need to be stressed also for these you know, local community conversations. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be very useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? My first question is, who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> who's counting all of those little teeny times? <laughs> the first thing that came to mind is, is it collected in the human body over time? So it comes in such small increments that I don't even know why it's a conversation. Um, but as, and nobody's drinking a liter with that in there. Right, doing it. right. So for the average human being, I'm kind of wondering why is this a conversation, um, but is it collective over time? 
So, mm. so is that why it's a concern? I'm, no, I'm no. Curious, I don't understand why it's a concern. Well, you know, I, I mean, if it, let's, let's say under the worst case scenario that, that someone was allowed to drill a well right up adjacent to one of the cavities and they started pumping the well, they could conceivably be exposed to elevated levels of tritium for extended periods of time. Let's say, just say like, you know, U.S. governance just fell apart and, and you had an indigenous farmer who just moved in there and started pumping water and lived off of it. That would create a reference dose that, or a dose that would be elevated and might end up in some sort of cancer or something like that. But you, under current time, there are, no one is going to see that. But it is the regulatory threshold that we have to deal with. You know, it's, it's been imposed upon us and that's what we're going to work against. And the great thing is that even with these extremely conservative protective measures, we're still not predicting any tritium at those levels to reach any potential receptor. So it's a, and it's a very conservative approach. It's a very protective approach. Oh, the 50 million? You and I are. We're going to sit down and we're going to do it. <laughs> are we producing more of this material in the Are we producing more of it? Um, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. We're certainly not producing more on the test site other than at a national security site. Um, the nuclear reactors, those are, those are creating it every year in very small amounts. There may be specialized programs where they're creating tritium for special needs, um, and uh, but I'm not aware of those. So, excellent presentation, Chuck. So, because um, I may not come across as the cuddly, feely kind of person, I'm going to go. No, over you there. do actually. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the critters. First of all, mm -hmm. so I know we're talking about groundwater, and they're, and they're not digging down into several hundred feet to get into the groundwater. But has the tritium ever been detected on the surface of the spring or uh, the spring? There are the vegetation. Okay, well, well, let's let's go to the to the most extreme cases. Okay, and. Uh, when we do uh, a near field investigation like ER 20-7, uh, we're pumping that water directly out of ground and we put them into line sumps. So you have sources of water that the native life has gotten into and been exposed to elevated levels of tritium. All right, so that's the worst case. The discharge from U12E tunnel is slightly elevated in tritium, all right? And and animals can get to that very, very easily. Um, the natural springs, you know, you're talking about the springs on the test site, like White Rock, um, Captain Jack, those. At one time, you know, when there was elevated tritium in the atmosphere, those had elevated discharge, all right? But nothing from groundwater. Those are completely connected from the, disconnected from the regional groundwater flow system. So, so my question goes down to, and I appreciate clarifying that a little bit, my question goes down is, has anybody done any studies on any of the critters uh, yes. on the test site? And if they have, um, uh, you know, we only mentioned the, the testing on the rats, but uh, some biologists out there may have some interest on the impacts to the natural fauna. I know that they uh, take um, uh, biological samples from deer, um, out there, they report that in the annual site environmental report whenever they do that. I'm not familiar with how extensive that program is. That program is done under NNSA, um, but I do know that they do it. And you can see those results on the annual report. I think they have the annual reports in front of them too, a summary of them. Oh. Okay, very good. I don't know if it talks about the biological samples that are collected. <laughs> You're going to do all the counting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if I just, like, I don't, again, this is not your round house, so I right. understand that. Yeah. But, uh, and maybe in this report, that's fine. But, uh, you know, I'm not aware of it, and that's fine. But I think it would be nice to have some kind of a, a graph or whatever, some kind of a data put together from an NSA side, maybe to show that or what it was going to depict on trading dosages in types of fauna and how that's been tracked over the 25 or 50 years. I don't know how long you've been doing it, so that's it's kind of a new thing for me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Sure, if I could. I think what you'd see routinely in the site environmental reports, Phil, is there's a routine <coughs> in 
<laughs> there's any information included in there in the uptake study. So if there is a uh, if there if there is a, a nut line or some other uh, animal that's had that has, uh, has died, they will take samples from it. So we'll look to see if there's been any sort of radioactivity up there. You'll find all those results summarized in the report. The more the thicker and more detailed side environmental report has a much more exhaustive discussion of, of uh, uh, that kind of makes sense. And those have been going on for years. I'm uh, Ron Warren with uh, MSDS, with MSDS Ecological and Environmental Monitoring. Oh, perfect. We do that work exactly, and we actually in the annual site report, we'll, in the dose chapter, we actually have a dose to humans and a dose to biota um, based on all the sampling we did that year. Um, so we are continually doing that as our annual uh, routine sampling um, work. And it's in, in Mr. Mr. Chair, my, 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 so it, it, one question comes to that though is that there is no standard, or is there a standard for for the fauna, or is it just the data that's being collected? There, there is a standard. The Department of Energy has set those limits to protect populations of uh, both plants and animals. Um, it's about one rad per day, quite much higher than human um, dose levels, and that's based on. Um, the history of, of studies that have shown effects of reproduction. And so they set those dose limits as a, in a DOE order, and then we calculate the dose, and we, uh, I mean, less than 1%, less than, certainly less than 4% of the dose limits for biota over the history of our sampling. Okay, so this might not even be a relevant question. I don't know, but it kind of doesn't make sense to me. He's, all this was done. When did the tritium come into play as being dangerous? And like, if somebody got too exposed to the tritium, what is done for that person? Um, that sounds like a medical question to me. <laughs> and I'm not qualified to answer that. <laughs> So I, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to turn back <laughs> because I think I think you know one of the things I don't want people to lose sight of here is why we're why we concentrate on tritium. Tritium is not the only thing that we're looking for, but there are several reasons why we concentrate on looking for it, and I think that will help answer the question in kind of a roundabout way. Yeah, so, so obviously, you know, when, when a nuclear detonation occurs, there's a lot of tritium that's released in the atmosphere and, or to, to the test cavity, and once that cools down, um, it's going to combine with oxygen and create water, and so it goes into the groundwater. You know, that's where it all goes, and a water molecule that's got a tritium atom hung on it versus a water molecule that's made of two proteum atoms, they act almost identically, all right? There's only a very extreme circumstances like strong magnetic fields and things like that where you would ever see any differences. And it moves with the groundwater. It's a perfect groundwater tracer. And so it's abundant. It's the, mo it's the radionuclide that's created the most of. It's got the highest uh, levels of activities because there's so much of it. Um, and it moves with water. And so nothing, in, in our experience, you don't see elevated levels of any other the radionuclides unless you see Ele really elevated levels of tritium. And so, and tritium is so easy to measure. You know, we can collect a sample, send it off to a commercial lab, do the routine detection, and for 60, 80 bucks per sample, bang, we know whether there's tritium there or not. And so it's so easy and so cheap, and nothing else exceeds it without seeing the elevated tritium levels first. Now, in 100 years, that's not going to be true because all the tritium is going to be decayed away. And there will be things moving around that we won't know about, you know, unless we measure for them. But right now, tritium is the thing to look for. I can't answer your medical question. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah.